Good morning, Kings. I'm asking you to stand. We're going to sing this hymn. Brought up to a bit more contemporary speed. Go we'll put your hands together this morning. Here we go. Let's do it. Here we go. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
Your love is amazing. And Lord, we thank you for your love. Even though we don't deserve it, we're sinners. God, you give us grace and mercy. And Lord, we love you and we sing your praises this morning. We seek that everything we do here today and everything we do in our lives benefits your kingdom. And we give you all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, go ahead and have a seat. Is this one on now? Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Kingsland Baptist Church. Uh, just a few announcements before we continue to worship our Lord and Savior. Um, this afternoon, uh, immediately after the service, we do have a luncheon uh, for all members that are participating in Operation Chesterfield. And then we're going to break up in our uh, different ministries uh, right after that luncheon. Some canvassing, some going to the nursing home, and uh, some doing other things as well. So we invite you to please come and participate on that. Um, I'm speaking to you this morning because I'm in charge of the, uh, the block party, the uh, fall festival that's happening on Wednesday, October 31st. Um, and we are in need of many, many, many volunteers. And I want to challenge you uh, to get involved. Um, as I have challenged my daughters and my wife and my entire family, I, God has blessed me um, enormously with an incredible, hardworking family. Um, you may have seen us, and, and forgive me if I'm bragging a little bit, I just, I'm, I love my family so much and I'm so proud of them. Um, from the beginning, we've been at the block parties and we're there to set up and we're there to break down. And literally, my daughters, if you've been there, you may have seen them either work snow cones or work cotton candy, uh, work Easter egg hunt or one thing, bouncers, one thing after another. We're always, always, always serving. And one of the things they asked me this year was, um, if you're in charge of it, that just means more work for us. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, probably. <laughs> I'm not going to deny it. I firmly believe in serving. Um, my friends, my family, if anyone ever needs something from me, all they have to do is ask. The answer, nine times out of ten, if I'm available, will be yes. And I speak yes on my, on my entire family because we believe in serving. And so I want to challenge you, members of Kingsland, to serve. Um, I'm going to call just a couple people, a few people to just, if, when I call your name, if I would ask you to please come up and stand just along the front, I want you to put a face with the name, and I'm going to tell you the different areas where they're going to serve. And after this service, I would like for you to approach these people and tell them that you would be willing to serve them in, that, uh, in their area. Now, these members that are leading these areas, um, they're not leading it so that they can stay at that table for the entire evening. That's not the purpose. Their job as leaders is to get members of Kingsland to help them out, to be there for a certain time slot. We have enough members here in Kingsland where if everybody does 30 minutes in one of the areas, then the rest of the evening is off in yours, okay? Um, and it, do it goes a long way to pr promoting the kingdom, making the night a lot more enjoyable for everyone rather than just the same, the same people year after year, party after block party after block party, serving and doing the same thing. So I'm gonna ask you, even if you're canvassing, even if you're doing food pantry, even if you're doing the, uh, uh, the, the nursing home ministry or any of that, I'm gonna challenge you, please give at least one half hour to the fall festival on that Wednesday. Okay, maybe you can't come in the morning. I mean, maybe you can't set up, but you can help break down. Maybe you can't set up or break down, but maybe you can monitor a game or a bouncy or the registration table or something for 30 minutes. Um, we do it, <laughs> and y'all know how many kids we have, and we always find time for my wife to find 30 minutes, for me to find 30 minutes, my daughter's Megan to find 30 minutes, which turns into 35 to 80 minutes, and all that as well. Um, and we're trying to streamline it to make it more convenient for our church members as well. So as I uh, call your names, I'm asking you to just stand and you can just come up to the front here. For Trunk or Treat, in charge of the Trunk or Treat is my beautiful wife, Amy. So she's just going to stand from up here. She's in charge of Trunk or Treat. Um, for the Cakewalk, we have Miss Beth Buckwalter. Come on down. Um, the prize table and such will be Miss Elizabeth right up here. For registration is Jeannie Brock, if you can come on in and stand up front. For concessions, cotton candy and snow, uh, not snow cones, too cold for snow cones. Cotton candy and popcorn, we have Ed Faggart, so come on up. Um, bouncers, Zach Johnstone, right over here. Um, security, Kenny Wants was voluntold by his wife. 
So thank you, Kenny. Um, uh, and then Pastor Pat's going to be taking care of the drawing and the prizes and such. Pastor Derek is taking care of all music and things along those lines for, this night, for that night. We do have a few opening areas where we still need leaders. Once again, the leaders, and I've told them, you know, we're not expected to do the entire thing the entire night. In some cases, they're not even expected to be there to set up. We're going we're gonna to assist with that. We need members to help set things up. We need people to help break things down in the afternoon. I'm actually taking off the entire day of work so I can come here that morning and start getting, getting things set up. Um, we need people that can just help with security, do a 30-minute shift with security. Uh, we need people to make chili, to make cakes for the cakewalk. And even if you do these things in advance, I ask you to still give 30 minutes of time so that the rest of us can enjoy the evening. I challenge you, members of Kingsland, to do that, okay? Um, there's, I don't believe at all that God has called us to simply sit in a pew, sing songs, and listen silently to a, to a sermon. I don't believe God's called us to do that. He's called us to serve. And this is one way that we can get up Kingsland and serve. No matter, your, no matter your age, no matter your abilities, there is something somewhere during this block party and even during the, all of Operation Chessfield that you can serve. So I challenge you to do that, okay? I challenge you to um, go beyond your comfort zone and serve. And if you have any more questions, uh, you can see me. If you want to serve in one of these different areas, I invite you to see one of these leaders. Um, or at the very least, if you're open to doing many things or certain areas, to sign up on the sign-up sheets that are in uh, the Sunday schools. And I believe there's one in the back as well. Sign-up sheets are in the back as well. So, all right. So let's pray, and then we're going to continue to worship our Lord. Thank you. Father God, we love you, Lord. And uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, just this challenge that has been brought forth to us. And I look forward to the uh, results of uh, our members at Kingsland standing up and uh, serving you, uh, not just for Operation Chesterfield, not just for the Block Party Lord and Fall Festival, but Lord, serving you in their daily lives, uh, serving you uh, just in our, in, our, in our jobs, for our friends and for our family, God, uh, showing that you shine through us Lord, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand to our feet and let's continue to worship.
And we have a new song we're going to sing for you this morning. And I invite you to, once you get the chorus part of this, uh, go ahead and join us. I'll sing the verses for you uh, since it's new. But uh, as you hear this chorus, I want you to reflect on it. Reflect on the words of the verses as well. Just what they mean in your life. Yeah. 
I read this week someone said worship it. Singing is praying and praying is singing. And that song is a prayer. So pray with me. Our Father, we thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity to worship you. And we just pray that as we do this, we'll lift up your holy name and that we'll give you all the glory and all the power and all the honor. And Father, we just thank you so much for your many blessings. We ask that you will bless these offerings and tithes as we bring them to you as, as an act of worship, as we humble ourselves before your throne. Use them for the building of your kingdom and for your purposes and your use to bring souls to you, that they might know Jesus Christ as their Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He's not mad at you And he's not disappointed His grace is greater still Than all of your wrong choices He is full of mercy And he is ever kind Here is invitation His arms are
Thank you, choir. That was awesome. Thank you, praise team, for leading us in worship today. Um, isn't it awesome to know that you can come to Jesus? He will take you just like you are. He loves you. He'll forgive you. He will wrap you up in his arms. He will take care of you. And um, little ones in kid zone, don't forget about that while you're leaving. We forgot to dismiss you earlier. Kid zoners, kindergarten, second, first, second grade. If you want to, you can go. If you want to stay and hear me preach, you can stay too. That'd be even better. But um, all right. Look at these beautiful little ones. Aren't they awesome? We just sang, uh, thank you, Jeff, for what you said before you prayed. You know, we just sang a prayer, and when we pray, we're singing, bless the Lord, O my soul. Say that, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Awesome just to praise God like that. That's an awesome song. I'm going to ask our band, someone might want to tell Chris about this whenever he comes back, and let's sing that again in just a minute. That was that was really awesome. That was, that was, wasn't that awesome? Wasn't that a beautiful song? Let's sing that again for our invitation. Let's just worship the Lord with that song one more time to close off our day when we have our invitation in just a minute. And uh, I, I'm just mindful, you know, God's love. And Janet, boy, do I love hearing Janet sing. And she just reminded us of his unconditional love. And we live in a community that desperately needs that love. In fact, we live in a, a world that desperately needs We are in a building full of people young and old, rich and poor, or everything in between, probably a lot of us in the middle somewhere, who desperately need that love, who need a fresh touch from Jesus, who need a spark. And um, I want to pray for them. I want to pray, pray about that. But I, I want to be more specific what I'm talking about. Um, I, I am a spark plug genius. Not really, but um, I, I, I'm not a real hand, you know, fix it kind of guy. Thank God I've got people in my life that fix stuff for me all the time. And uh, some of our deacons and some of the men in this church and, and women who are much more um, mechanical than me um, fix things. But when I can fix something, man, it's a big event in our house. When I fix, it's like, whoa! And uh, Friday, I was cutting the grass. And because it's about that high and I hadn't cut it in a long time, it kept getting jammed. And uh, I, I got tired of turning it off and pulling the grass out. So I finally, I'd like knock it around and turn it as it was going and try to, well, when you do that, the oil gets all up in the engine and starts shooting out the muffler and, and uh, all kinds of problems. So my, my lawnmower just stopped. It was done. And this is, this, this is our new lawnmower. Um, someone came to our house Friday. I'm not going to say who it was, but he's here. And he said, man, your lawnmower sounds horrible. Oh, man. I said, yeah, it's my new lawnmower. But I keep banging around trying to declog out the grass. And, and, um, and, 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 well, it wouldn't even start after that. And I was thinking, man, this is terrible. But I'd gotten some bad um, gasoline so before, so I went and got some fresh gasoline, put it in there. That didn't work. I'm pulling and pulling and pulling. This thing usually starts first pull. It's a real, it's, it's a real nice lawnmower. Um, and I'm thinking, so, you know, what is wrong with this thing? So finally, I said, I wonder if it's a spark plug. So I'm, and I, I got on the Internet and looked around on some things. You know, if you shake your lawnmower around a lot, the oil will <laughs> blow out the muffler and mess up your spark plug. So I, I found the closest thing to a pair of pliers that would work because my pliers are gone, probably stuck in the sandbox somewhere. Um, and I found some needle nose pliers for something else, but I got around that spark plug and finally got it out, uh, loose enough so I could undo it. And sure enough, there was oil all over it and shooting out the hole, and I pulled it a couple times and cleaned it as good as I could. Went and got a fresh spark plug for two bucks. Came back, put it in, put the spark plug on, pulled it. Man, that thing started up on the second pull. Then I stopped, went upstairs, bragged to my wife and kids about how I fixed the lawnmower. Um, that's the first thing I fixed in a long time. And, um, but, 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 hold, you know, I don't, did, we, did John wanted to play with the old spark plug? Did we ever find it? I don't know where the old spark plug is, but they wanted to play with that. And, um, okay, here, here's what, the rest of the lawn mowing experience, here's what I thought about. I thought about our church. And I've told you before, I pray when I cut the grass. I pray a lot when I cut the grass. And um, try to rehearse my sermon, all this kind of thing. It's usually on Friday, and I usually have one in mind. But as I'm cutting the grass and I'm thinking about that lawnmower, ladies and gentlemen, I, just, I want you to hear me. I thought about my message, and I thought about how unimportant my message is compared to this message. Some of us need to take off the wire, unscrew the old spark plug that's dead. I think Kingsland, in many cases, needs a new spark plug. And, and some of us, me included sometimes, I'm not, it's almost like you just need someone to perform open heart spark plug surgery. Take the wire off, unplug that old one, 
And we just need a fresh spark. Have you ever felt that way? You're just kind of oh, just going through the motions, just kind of getting by, and you're not really enthusiastic about your class anymore like you used to be. And you're not really enthusiastic about your church like you used to be, or, or, or the, 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 the ministry you used to be involved in, or, or whatever it may be, and you're just and you're tired. And, and look, I understand. Believe me, I understand. We get tired. Elizabeth and I get really, really tired. And, and so many things going on, and they're all good things. <clears throat> I want to ask you this morning as we pray right now, if you'd bow your heads and close your eyes. I just want you to think about your own heart and whether or not somehow, and I don't even know how to explain it to you because I don't know how to pull out the old one and put in a new one. And I'm not even suggesting your heart's in the wrong place or anything like that. I'm just asking you to look inside your heart. And if down deep you're tired, maybe you're defeated, some of you are grieving and you're suffering, Folks, we have folks in our church that are in a tremendous amount of hurt and pain, financial struggles, losing their homes, and, 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 and difficult, difficult, they, don't, they hate their jobs. Some are having marital problems, problems with kids. The text we're going to read this morning is just two weeks, two verses, but it's probably going to take us two weeks to deal with it. And I really believe at the core of where we are and the core of where I am and where the core of some of you are and some of us are is that you just need a new spark. So why don't you ask God to give you that where you are, to really speak to your heart, to wake you up. My, it may have been a long time since you've shed a tear for anybody or anything. Your heart's grown cold and hard, critical, apathetic. Take that to the Lord and ask him to just, to, to spiritually speaking, just shove a new spark plug in there and wake you up and make you alive. I can tell you, if your voice isn't raspy from belting out that song, man, is that song high. Did you notice how high that song is? You really have to chant that thing. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Whether you're physically hurting or have gone through difficult times or discouraged or depressed, or whether you're the exact opposite. Things are going great and you're on cloud nine. Listen, either way, blessed be the name of the Lord. And you're going to get a chance to sing that song in a, in a, again in a minute for our invitation. And I want to ask you to sing it like, you, like you've never sung any song. That's what it says. We have 10,000 years. We have 10,000 reasons and many more to worship the Lord. And that's what we're going to do for all of eternity. So we need to prepare ahead of time to do that. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just pray. Oh, God. Light a fire in my heart. Spark that flame again. Consume me with passion for you and love for others. Oh God, help me. Help us as a church. Wake us up. Bring revival. Lord, I pray for that for my nation. Bring a revival to our country. Lord, I pray that for the nations. Bring revival into our lives. Wake us up. Help us, to, help us to really sense in reality what Janet just sang about, and that is your love is unconditional. You're always there for us. You care about us so much. Thank you, Jesus, for that. And because of that, we say, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. All that's within me, I will bless his holy name. We will bless your holy name in this place, Lord Jesus, because you're good and you're rich in mercy. And when our days are through, Lord, we'll look back and think back to years and years and years of worshiping you and look forward to an eternity of praising you, kneeling down before your throne, never ever to hurt again, never to ever lose anyone again, never to ever to, to be frustrated or broke or in debt or, or struggling or sick or dealing with cancer, none of it. Oh God, help us to remember that's our future, that's the promise. Victory is ours. We have victory in you. Lord, help us to live that way in the meantime and help us to grow a little bit each and every day closer to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I've done some research and, and I've had a, a, some discrepancies on this, but did you know that horses never quit growing? My mom's an equestrian. She's big into horses. She never told me that. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure alligators never quit growing. Turtles, reptiles, um, crocodiles um, never stop growing. And I'm sure many of you are Googling that on your iPhones right now. Don't do that. Snakes, some snakes, and never quit growing. Fish. If you turn over to 2 Peter, we're going to see that we are to never stop growing. 
No matter how old you are, no matter how many degrees you have, no matter how many letters you have behind your name, you never stop growing. You know, we're talking about family matters. Family matters. And, and growing together, that's the title of the message today. And I have notes for you next week. We'll get started today and finish it up next week. You see, you're either getting stronger or weaker. You're either growing or you're not. And that spark plug, by the way, that spark plug I was talking about, it's your relationship with Jesus. When you're close with Jesus, when you're intimate with Christ, you have a spark that nobody can take away from you. And some of us just need to re-spark that. You know, kids just grow. If you notice that, they just constantly grow. And they need new shoes. Boots. They think it's their sovereign right to have boots. And, and, and new shirts and clothes and shoes and socks and coats. Gets expensive, doesn't it? They just keep growing. Why? Because we keep feeding them. We feed, they grow. They keep learning. They keep changing physically and mentally. But here's the question. Are your kids growing spiritually? Young people, are you growing spiritually? What are you doing, mom, dad, grandparents, teachers, uncles, aunts, all of us? What are you doing to help the kids grow spiritually? Family has been on my mind a lot lately, and, and, and in a minute I'll, I'll, I'll give another illustration about that, but America is fascinated with the family. You notice a lot of the television shows, you go back to the 50s, you know, Leave it to Beaver, it's a, it's a family show. Fathers Knows Best, was that in the 60s? And then and in the 70s you had the Brady Bunch, and New Heart, and, and, and family. It all revolves around family. You get up into the the uh, 80s, man, the 80s was full of family shows. You had uh, Growing Pains and Family Ties and The Cosby Show. And Then in the 90s, you had um, Home Improvement. Is that what it was called? Home Improvement with Tim the Tool Man? You had Home Improvement. And then in the 90s, you had Everybody Loves Raymond and other family shows. Today, you have Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Please tell me you don't watch that. Um, and my wife's new favorite, Duck Dynasty. <laughs> Who's seen Duck Dynasty? Raise your hand. Look at how proud they are. Bunch of rednecks <laughs> watching Duck Dynasty. Um, these people have made a million dollars selling duck bird cars. They're rich and they live in a mansion. And they're a bunch of like cut off sleeve people riding around on four wheelers living in a mansion selling duck collar things. How many of them have they sold to make that much money? But the whole thing revolves around the family. Last week it was teaching their 15, 16-year-old girl how to drive. We've all been there. You know, we're fascinated with the family. The family is important. Family matters. I don't care who you talk to. You go up in the pike, you go out in these neighborhoods, go up in the city, you talk to people. What matters to them? Their family. I do a lot of funerals, and thank God this year I've not done many, but there's been times I've done dozens. And when you talk to people and, and, and their loved one's gone, it, it's all about family. And some of them are very important, accomplished, sometimes wealthy, sometimes significant people in the community and all that. What do they want to talk about? They want to talk about their family. Family is what matters. And I would ask you, is your family growing closer to Christ? Is your family growing stronger? You know, for most of human history, fathers taught their sons a trade, whether it be farming or, or carpentry or shepherding or cattling or, you know, whatever. Mothers taught their daughters for thousands of years uh, cooking, gardening, sewing, whatever. Today, fewer moms and dads pass the family trade on to their sons and to their daughters. They, we, we send them to school. They go and they learn a trade or they go to college or whatever to learn how to make a living. Others educate them. Others train them. But hopefully, hopefully, you do teach them your family values. Hopefully, we still pass on our family values. What's important to your family you know, what are you passing down to your kids? That's what I want you to ask yourselves. What are you doing to disciple and to train your grandkids, your nieces, your nephews? What plan do you have in place to help the younger generation to grow spiritually as a church? Are we just hoping just to kind of do a bunch of stuff and get it done, or are we strategic? See, I really believe, I'll say this before we read this text, I believe you do pass on your family values. And if hunting and fishing is more important than God and the Bible... You pass that down to your kids. They see that. They see what's important to you. They value it, and they will be a lot like you, nine times out of ten. 
they'll be a lot like you. If you value the Lord, husband, if you really take care of your wife and you show that, your kids see that. If you talk down to her and, and, and humiliate her and, and, and belittle her and treat her like they see that too, it affects them. The way we treat each other, how a wife talks to her husband, that affects your children. How you talk about other adults, how you talk about other authority figures in your kids' lives tremendously affects them. If you get those beautiful lights shining in your mirror, the blue ones, because you were doing something wrong, this has never happened to me. I'm talking theoretically. And he or she comes and talks to you and points out what you're doing wrong, which you know good and well you were doing wrong. And I'll be honest, I'm speaking from personal experience. When he or she's done with you and leaves you a little note, love note, <laughs> with, with where to be and who to meet and how much your fine's going to be and all that kind of thing, Listen, what you say after that, about that authority figure, your kids are listening. I can't believe, how dare he? He should have known. Why would he? He was picking on me, you know. How you, how you respond to when your kids come home with a letter from their parent, from the teacher? There are a lot of teachers in here. I know I got support on this one. When your kids come home with a letter from the teacher, and it's, oh, it's all their fault. Why are they trying to? I know working in youth ministry, the hardest thing I ever had to do was talk to a parent about bad behavior from their kids. And, I, and I'd love to say it always went great. I can tell you it rarely went great because they're too busy defending them and making excuses for them. I mean, do you really think a youth leader is going to come and talk to you and, and point out some problem with your child? Do, most of them are volunteers. Derek's the only one who gets paid. Do you really think they want to come and do that? Do you think he wants to come and do that? Believe me. If a children's worker or, or, or somebody, a teacher, an authority figure in your life comes and confronts you about something, they don't want to do that. They're not look, very few people are looking for that kind of a confrontation. How do, you, how do you respond when you get corrected? How do you respond when, um, when someone points something out? Are you, do you have a plan to grow your family or is it just kind of haphazard and you just sort of show up to church once or twice a month and here we are? That's the question. Okay. Look at the text. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard, so that you are not led away by the error of the immortal and fall into your own stability. Fall from your own stability. But rather, instead of, do this, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. I would like to ask you to do me a favor. This week, it's only three chapters. Take time to read 2 Peter, the whole book. It's just three chapters. Because when it says in verse 17, Therefore, dear friends, Peter's writing to churches scattered across the world. Dear friends, I love you. You're my friends. I'm giving you helpful advice. I care about you. Since you have been forewarned. Now, we're going to start today whew, a little bit looking at the, the warnings. Next week, maybe we'll finish that. But you have been forewarned in the book of 2 Peter, all the way back into the Old Testament, into the Minor Prophets, warns us about some things. Therefore, be on your guard so that you are not led away by the error of the immoral or fall from your own stability. Be on your guard because what it's saying is someone wants to knock you down. Someone wants to lead you astray. So be on your guard. Be careful. Be vigilant. Be sober. Be vigilant for the, the devil is a roaring lion roaming around, seeking whom he may devour. Well, that's one verse every parent should have memorized, every grandparent should have memorized, because you need to understand, your kids are under attack. Our kids are under attack from the evil one. Be careful, be on your guard, so that you're not led away by the error of the immoral and fall from your instability. But grow in the grace in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The top priority of the family should be to grow strong disciples. The top priority of our church family, as, as a church, we should be to connect people to Christ, but not just in a one-time encounter. We're going to go all over the place today and try to connect people with Jesus. It's not a one-time encounter. It's a lifelong relationship. But the top priority of the family, 
your family, my family, should be to disciple or to reproduce or to build or to grow strong disciples. We should be training and preparing them. And the question to ask yourself right off the bat is, how can you lead your kids to grow spiritually if you're not growing spiritually? How can you, how can you do that? How can you, leaders of our church, and, and many of you are in leadership positions, how can you lead in the church to grow this church more spiritually if you're not growing spiritually? Teachers, youth leaders, adult leaders, women's, men's ministry, all of us, pastor, staff, deacons, everybody. How in the world can you lead others to grow spiritually if you're not growing? And, and a question we asked, I talked a little bit about with our Bible study class this morning is, do, do they want it? Do young people want to be led like that? Do the children want this kind of attention? I did not do a survey with them, so I can't speak authoritatively on it. But my guess is the majority of them do. Some of them don't, let's be honest. Some of them would rather you just shove it and leave them alone. But a lot of them, I think a lot of them would really like that kind of attention. But the question is, will you take the time? Will you expend the energy to train up the next generation? And that means finding kids that aren't your kids. That, fi that means finding people that you aren't automatically responsible for. That means other adults that are new in the faith that you have no reason other than just they're your brother and sister in Christ and you want to help them out. You see, our church exists to, to, to assist moms and dads in their mission to disciple their own children. We do that by providing Bible studies and, 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 and on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights for adults to, to help them strengthen spiritually. We provide worship services like this one for the entire family to come and participate in praising God corporately. We offer children's and youth and Bible studies and events and camps and retreats and various programs that to, designed to reinforce, hopefully, what they're learning at home. Some of our kids don't have a Christian home. Many of the ones we bring in, they don't, they don't have a Christian home. So we're, we're really the only spiritual outlet they have. We're all they've got. And oftentimes... Um, adults who may not have kids at home or whatever invest a lot of time and energy into them because they need it. Folks, we want to be a family-friendly, family-focused church. That's what this community needs, a family-friendly, family-focused church. Our church is one great big family made up of little families. And if you feel like you're alone today, believe me, you're not. You're part of the family. We love you. We love each other. We're here to serve one another. And I think Christopher has, has talked this morning. We're here to serve one another and, we, and the community. But again, that spark that, that has died or is dying in so many folks' hearts, it's not a, it's not a hey, go out and do more or, 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 or change this or start doing that. Or, it's more of a where, where are you in your relationship with Christ? Are you growing closer to Christ? Just like that 100-year-old turtle down at the zoo they just keep growing, and they live a long time. God's not done with you. You're still here, part of a family, and we should be growing together. So with that in mind, there's really a, a, an admonition I want to give that will cover us for the next two weeks, and it's this, these two words, be proactive. Be proactive. Of course, you say proactive, and the first thing you probably think of is that acne medicine stuff. I'm not talking about that. Be proactive. Take the initiative. We can't just hope this stuff happens. We can't just sort of pretend like everything's going to be okay. And So here it is. Two things. We'll do one today and one next week. Be proactive in guarding your family from all the danger that surrounds it. We need to be proactive. We need to be intentional. We need to be on our guard about all the danger that surrounds our families. Look back at the text, verse 17. Since you have been warned... Be on your guard so you are not led away, so that you do not fall. Let's talk about that. Warnings. First thing I think of is like those stickers everybody puts on their windows, you know, such and such security company. They don't even have security, they don't have an alarm, but they got a sticker. What are you telling people? You know, if you come in here, an alarm's going to go off. And an hour and a half later, someone might come and check up on it. Smoke alarms. Ours are so sensitive. Oh, what a pain they are. They go off all the time. Time change is coming. You're supposed to change batteries in your smoke alarms. We already did it. They're working good. 
they will drive you up the wall. Why do you have locks on your doors? Why do you have airbags in your car? Why do you have seatbelts? And, and, and why, did you, why do you, many, many of us are gun owners, and, or maybe you have, you, you, your hands are a lethal weapon because you studied martial arts. Why? Why? Why do we do that? I mean, are we living in such a dangerous world that we're just afraid we're going to have to put up our dukes at any moment and, and have a gun on our side? To, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't needed to recently, but if something ever happened, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy that one of you did. It's being proactive. It's being on guard. It's, it, it's, it, it, we know there's danger. We've been forewarned. We've seen the commercials with what happens to people when they don't wear their seatbelt. We've seen the commercials what happens to people's heads when they don't wear motorcycle helmets, although I'm against it, motorcycle helmet laws. But you'd be crazy to, to not wear a helmet, driving down the road with your melon, flying down the road at 70 miles an hour. It's not going to be good when it piles into a telephone pole or something. We're proactive about so many things. What about our kids? See, we need to be proactive in guarding our kids and our family, not just our children, me and you and, your, and, your, and, and, and those older than you. There's people that will scam them. There's people that will take advantage of them. We need to be looking both ways on this, our, uh, the, old, the younger adults to the older ones, the older adults to the younger ones, and down to the children. We need to be uh, on guard. That doesn't mean be defensive and looking for a fight and confrontational all the time. It just means that we're vigilant. We're sober. We're careful. I mean, that's a little bit about what Operation Chesterfield's about, isn't it? We're going to the community and saying, hey, there's danger coming. You need, you need to get saved. I mean, the whole concept of being saved acknowledges that there's a danger out there that you need to be saved from. Okay, so the text says forewarned, forewarned. If you read this book, for Second Peter, you will see certain things about De deceivers. Look, just look one verse above the text. If you're there in, in, in chapter 3, look at verse 16. Paul spake about the, 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 um, these things in his letters, in which are some matters that are hard to understand. Peter's saying that Paul wrote letters, and he calls them Scripture. It's one, one reason we know the letters of Paul and Peter are Scripture, authoritative Scripture, word, the Word of God. And he says that untaught and unstable twist them to their own destruction. So they take those difficult passages from Ephesians and Philippians and even 1 and 2 Peter. And what do they do? They twist them to their own destruction as they also do with the rest of scriptures. That means there are religious people. I was online with one last night looking at a church in our city that is apostate. There are religious people, and it's a Baptist church, by the way. Must anybody think we're bashing on the, the Mormons or the Catholics or anybody else? Although we will if we need to. Um, this is a church that has the name Baptist on, on its sign. That is apostate. They're twisting scripture. So we live in a world full of danger. Look, look, look back quickly back into 2 Peter. Look at verse, chapter 2. Those of you there in, in, in our text, just go back one chapter, chapter 2. But there were fa also false prophets among them. Chapter 2, verse 1. There were also false prophets among them. Just as there will be false teachers among you, they will secretly bring, bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, and will bring swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their unrestrained ways, and because of them, the way of the truth will be blasphemed. In their greed, they will exploit you with deceptive words. That just makes me think of much of what I see on Christian television right there. Their condemnation, pronounced long ago, is not idle. Their destruction does not sleep. So you have deceivers. You have deceivers from the outside world. You have deceivers from within the so-called church. Look at chapter 3. Let, listen, you need to protect your children from the danger that surrounds them. Whether it be at school, whether it be from the television, whether it be from the internet. If your children have unrestrained access to the internet, that's incomprehensible to me. That can't be. You're not protecting them. If your children have unrestrained access to any channel they want on cable, in their rooms, or anywhere else, that is very foolish. We need to protect them from that. If your children are allowed to just come and go and go to see whatever the movies they want and just hang out with everything, you don't even know their name, that's very foolish. And I'm sure, I, I can't believe that. Very many fall in that category. But let's talk about even, look at chapter 3. Dear friends, let's go to verse 3. I want to get to the point here. Be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days to scoff, following their own lusts. Scoffers will come. Now we're kind of getting outside of the realm of the church. And it's going to talk about the last days. This is something we need to warn our children about. The last days. Days. Scoffers will come. Who is that? Well, uh, read Christopher Hitchens. 
um, Ricky Gervais, Penn Jillette, Comedy Central, pretty much any sitcom on television, Howard Stern, Bill Maher, the university science, or whatever, the school science professor that believes in evolution and, and, and shoves that and, and makes fun of, they mock us for believing in creation. Scoffers will come in the last days to scoff following their lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. They willingly, willfully ignore this. Long ago, the heavens and the earth existed out of water and through water by the word of God. Through these, the world of that time perished when it was flooded by water. Do you know that a worldwide flood for most secular scientists is a joke? They don't believe in a that there was a worldwide flood. Some do. Most don't. And they make fun of us for believing in a flood. They make fun of us for be believing in creation. A lot of this sounds like evolution or, or laying the groundwork for teaching against evolution. Through these, the world that, of that time perished when it was flooded. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are held in store by fire. For fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of godly men. Do you think that's something maybe you need to warn your kids about? Do you think that's something we need to warn our kids' friends about, that judgment is coming? Dear friends, don't let this one thing escape you. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. In, in other words, time doesn't mean the same to him. And he's not in a rush. In fact, the Lord does not delay his promise. He's not slack concerning his promises, as, as some understand delay. But he's patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to perish. That's why we're telling people about Jesus today at the flea market and everywhere we go. That's why we have upward basketball, if we have upward basketball. That's why we run the buses. That's why we do collision, collision student ministries in here on Wednesday night. And, and the mission trip to Africa that we're planning and everything else. It's because we believe that God wants everyone to repent. Look at the, look at the text again. This is one of my life verses. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay. In other words, we think he's not on time, but he is on time. We think he's late, but he's not late. And we wonder, why did that injustice happen and God didn't do anything about it? Believe me, he's going to do something about it in his time, in his way. It's not our ways, and we don't understand. But he's patient with you. Can we just say thank God together? He's, he's patient with you. Thank God. I'm sure glad he's patient with me. I never deserve it. I never deserve his love, his patience. Don't deserve to be standing here doing this. It's his grace. It's unbelievable grace that he's poured out to make this happen. He's not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But, verse 10, please read this. If, you, if, you, if you're not there, 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, it's it, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness. Knowing that God's wrath is coming, that ought to affect how we live and how we raise our kids. As you wait for and earnestly desire the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be on fire, be dissolved, and the elements will melt with heat. But based on his promise, we wait for a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness Will dwell. So there's a lot of eschatology wrapped up into that text. Maybe we'll get more into it next week. But when we talk about Christ coming back, we think of that as a wonderful thing, and it is. But the day of the Lord has many different aspects to it. And, and, and you know, it's going to be horrible. It's going to be absolutely terrible for those who are godless, those who have thumbed their nose in, in God's face and said, No, God, I don't need you. In closing, go to the book of Joel in the, in the Minor Prophets. Just head to the Old Testament, go to Matthew, start going backwards. I want you to see this. You know, God is patient, but there's going to come a time when his patience runs out. And, and, and maybe your patience is running out and you're tired of sitting and listening. Just, just please give me another minute. Understand that God will deal with murder. Well, how did that, how did that murder happen? You know, they talk about in the city of Richmond, these murders happen, but they're not all, some of them are, the case is closed, some aren't. God's going to deal with every one of them. He's going to deal with deceit, immorality, abortion. Drunkenness, lying, hate, prejudice, cheating. He's going to deal with that in his timing. He's going to deal with rebellion and blasphemy and cursing and lust and adultery and fornication and homosexuality and pornography and gossip. And hey, church people, he's going to deal with pride. He's going to deal with your pride and mine. And the message is God is not slack concerning his promises, but he's patient, hoping, waiting that some will come to repentance and that was, and, he, and, and Peter said he was going to forewarn us. It goes all the way back to the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 11. The Lord raises his voice, Joel 2, Joel 2, 11. 
The Lord raises his voice in the presence of his enemy. His camp is very large. Those who carry out his command are powerful. Indeed, the day of the Lord is terrible and dreadful. Who can endure it? Hundreds of years before Peter's time, he was talking about the day of the Lord. 2,000 years past Peter's time, we are talking about the day of the Lord. Even now, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes. When they, when they were upset over something, they'd make a big scene ripping their clothes, rending, rending their clothes. He says, tear your hearts, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God, for he's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in mercy and faithful love. He relents from sending disaster. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him so you can offer grain and wine to the Lord. Verse 16 says, Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged and the children, the nursing. That's what we are today. The aged, the younger, the young people, the children, the teenagers, the babies. We're all here. Repent. We need to be proactive in guarding our family from the danger that surrounds it by giving them the message of repentance. Next week, we're going to talk about being proactive in growing our family in all that God wants it to be. That's verse 7. That's verse, the next verse, 18. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord. Today, the invitation is this. Repent. If you've been a slack grandparent or a slack friend who has friends that are ruining their lives and you've done nothing to even warn them, you have not been proactive, repent. If, God forbid, you're involved in some of those things I mentioned that we shouldn't be involved in, repent. <clears throat> Parents, if you've never once talked to your kids about the day of the Lord, if you've never once talked to them about spiritual things, you need to repent. We need to repent. If you're here and you're not yet a member of the family of God, you've not received Christ into your life, well, you do that by believing on, his, on, on what he did on the cross, dying and being buried and resurrecting and repenting. Maybe today is the day that you can be born again. It happens when you repent. God in heaven, I just pray that you would help us to, to, to understand the seriousness of the hour. It's not just an election coming in November. It's not just a stock market that's going up one or two percentage points or down. Lord, I pray that we would grapple with it. And as we worship you and sing this song again that we just learned today, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, that we could bless your holy name and praise you for the great God that you are. Lord, that some of us would repent of our laziness when it comes to worshiping you. Lord, this is a hard message and maybe not a very popular one, but it's very clear that it's exactly what you want for us in this time. Lord, I pray for every parent and grandparent. I pray for every uncle, aunt, for every youth leader, every adult that has any interaction whatsoever with any child or, or, or younger person. Lord, I pray that you would give them the courage to be proactive, knowing that the vast majority of these kids want it. And even the ones that don't want it, they need it. And they need someone to love them unconditionally. They need someone to reach out to them. Our community is in desperate need of people who will just love unconditionally that will display the love of Jesus. So Lord, I pray for the parents that are hurting today, that are going through difficulty, that are concerned for their kids. I pray that you'd encourage their hearts. I pray that you'd move right now, that your Holy Spirit would move in our lives and in our hearts and in our minds. And with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, we're going to sing, and, and, and we're really going to sing. I want you to sing. I mean, this is an invitation to worship Jesus. To just say, thank you, Jesus. Praise your name. If you have a burden on your heart and you'd like someone to pray with you, come forward and I'll pray with you. If you want to join our church, if you've given your heart to Jesus and you want to be baptized, come forward and request that. Today, if you're grappling about that, that very serious question, am I on my way to heaven or not? When the day of the Lord comes, are you prepared or are you not? You get prepared by being born again. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to show you how you can do that. We have other folks that will pray with you that will show you from the Bible how you can be saved. Or maybe you just want to take a minute at the altar and just pray for your family. There's nothing wrong with that. There may be things going on, health problems and other things that nobody else really even knows about, but you want to lay them down at the altar. I encourage you to take advantage of this invitation. You are invited to be proactive in your worship, to be proactive in your repentance. 
to be proactive in, in your prayers, to be proactive in your parenting. Would you stand with me? Let's sing. God in heaven, I pray that you would receive this worship. I pray that you would move in our lives right now in this invitation. In Jesus' name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The song. It's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be seen.
I'm going to pray and we will be dismissed and we'll head over to the Family Life Center for our meal before we start our first week of Operation Chesterfield. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word and I pray that we as uh, families would lead the way here in our church, God, that we would serve each other, that we would serve you, that we would be proactive in protecting our families and God, we just worship you and lift up your name through our praise and God, I pray that our life of praise would continue now. In your name I pray, amen. You guys are dismissed.